This video is brought to you by Established Titles. Stick around to the end to find out how you can become a Scottish Lord. The Daimyo Lord Omura Sumitara writes to a local samurai. Shortly, it will be the time for the ship of the Southern Barbarians to arrive. The ships of Portugal have been known here for two decades. Their holy men wander this land of the rising sun, speaking of an ancient messiah called Christ and converting throngs of commoners and Sumitada himself. Yet royal Portuguese ships now come to Fukuda Bay to trade with Sumitada, and they offer an item most cherished in this country, guns. The presence of Portuguese traders will not go unnoticed by the enemies of Sumitada. This is the age of Sengoku. Japan lies fragmented into warring states ruled by local lords called daimyo. And in these bellicose dominions, their grand palaces stand barren of fealty to the emperor and the shogun. In the cool dark of autumn, stern warriors gather, hailing from the Matsura clan. Once patrons of the Portuguese firearms trade, the Matsura have been passed over in favor of their enemies, and so the strongest among them are called to battle. Captain Major Dom João Pereira has received warning, but he has not fled. His decks are garrisoned by a feared class of soldier which, in the name of God in Portugal, has variously burned, conquered, and traded along the coasts of Brazil, Africa, India, and China. But the captain is soon arrested by the sight of 80 ships flooding the bay, and the crew beholds ranks of an older and storied warrior, the samurai. Both armies open with volleys of gunfire. A bullet strikes Pereira, but only dents his helmet. He staggers to his cabin. Hordes of samurai begin to scale the sides of the ship, braving a bursting fog of gun smoke. The deck becomes staged to a bloody melee, where men fall in that storm of bullets, clanging armor and swords and pikes. A few samurai cut through the battle, force themselves into the cabin, and capture Pereira. But the crossfire of Portuguese cannons has torn asunder many of the samurai vessels. Splinter and flesh drift across the bay. Pereira is rescued, and the samurai abandon the attack. It is not Portugal alone that heralds this age of global empire. Conquistadors from the rival Spain have waded through the Americas, and aided by disease and some indigenous allies, they have dethroned many kings and chiefs and proclaim themselves rulers in the New World. Spain has not contented itself there. The crown has sent armies into Asia, but they will not escape the reach of Japan. Villagers have seen them, gathering where the murky rivers drift into rainforest. The Spanish colonial governor relays word of these interlopers to his king. The Japanese are the most warlike people in this part of the world. They have artillery and many guns and lances, and they use defensive armor for the body made of iron, all of which they owe to the industry of the Portuguese. Nearly eight years have passed since Japanese and Chinese raiders attacked Spanish Manila. Spanish troops recall those first waves of barefoot swordsmen with bamboo hats and banners, an image consistent with low-ranking samurai. The Spanish had repelled them then, but no peace came of it, for the Japanese here do not answer to any daimyo or emperor. The Chinese Ming Dynasty retired its mighty naval vessels more than a century ago, and the surrounding seas fell into thievery plundered by pirates called Wako, of Chinese, Japanese, and Korean origin. Far from their home shores, Japanese Wako have nonetheless ventured ever more audaciously into the Philippines. They took first to smuggling in precious metals, and in 1580 and 81, they violently raided native settlements. The Japanese pirate lord, whom the Spanish call Teisufu, is amassing a small fleet of pirate ships. 
Spain deploys several ships under Juan Pablo de Carrion to crush them. The lead galley sets out and quickly captures a ship belonging to a Chinese pirate crew. Tezufu may sail with some Chinese and Filipino recruits, but his is a pirate fleet identified as Japanese, his crew containing samurai in only the most ignoble and hollow sense of the word. Warriors of Japan, but strangers to the old moral codes of Bushido, and some are perhaps ronin, wayward samurai who, to their own shame, no longer serve any master. It happens that off the northern coast of Luzon, the Spanish galley catches sight of a Japanese ship. The captain orders a barrage of cannon fire and splits the main mast of the pirate ship. The Spanish lurch toward the wounded vessel, only to be struck by a hail of grappling hooks and Japanese gunfire. Droves of furious pirates pull themselves onto the galley and draw pikes and swords. The Spanish batter and slay some of them, but the pirates tear through their ranks, and the Spanish abandon their position at the main mast. In a desperate stand, they raise their guns and wildly fire into the onslaught of pirates. The Japanese retreat to their vessel, which is then boarded by Spanish soldiers. The pirates fight them valiantly, yet they fall in wretched heaps under unrelenting Spanish fire. When only 18 remain, the pirates relinquish their bloodied weapons and surrender. The Spanish continue into the Cagayan River, and one chronicler recounts, The Spaniards found themselves in this region, but against the will of its inhabitants, who has little wish to see them there as to see the Japanese. And here, the Spanish accounts diverge. Tezufu is said to have been killed at some point, and the Spaniards later pen lurid tales of river or land battles, in which their countrymen vanquish a thousand Japanese and suffer hardly any losses. In truth, their triumph comes at a cost. Spaniards wash blood from their ship decks and bury the fallen. The colonial governor of the Philippines petitions the crown for reinforcements, and he admits, these occasions now are not so much a matter of jests as they have been hitherto, for the Chinese and Japanese are valiant people. So now the rumors can end. I finally have proof that I'm not a Scottish peasant. I am a lord. By Scottish tradition, landowners are the ladies and lords or lairds of their estates, and established titles now allows you to claim this majestic title by purchasing as little as one square foot of land in Edelston, Scotland. It's also just one of the best and most unique last minute gifts to get someone you care about. It comes with a fancy certificate with a crest and a unique plot number you can actually use to go look up your new estate. You can start throwing Lord and Lady on your credit cards and plane tickets, and the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will get plots near mine, so we can start building the fearsome History Dose Kingdom together. And don't worry, we'll still be kindly rulers. Established titles not only protects the woodlands of Scotland from construction and damage, but they also plant a tree with every order, and they partner with global charities, One Tree Planted, and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. It makes an amazing last-minute gift. Established Titles is actually running a massive sale. Plus, if you use the code DOSE10, you get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com forward slash DOSE10 to get your gifts now and help support the channel.